it up on the board here. Okay, how many of you were here last week for this lecture? More than half? Okay. So I had you do a little bit of homework in the end of class last time. I started to read through those. Uh, I got about halfway through and realized that while there were a few really good ones, there were a lot of you who made the same mistake. And here's roughly what your mistake was. Uh, so I would, I would ask for user needs last week. Need one of these. I have a user need for you guys to be on time. Um, right here. Um, so your user needs, you would say things like, it needs to be durable, it needs to be cost effective, and it needs to be reliable, right? And those are really great user needs. Now, what product did I just describe? Who knows, right? Could be anything. So one of the, the worst things you can do is miss the actual function or purpose of your device when you do your user needs. So we'll do a probably similar exercise at the end today where we do user needs and specifications. You can rewrite those user needs again. Most of you only had a few in your list. They should have been a little bit longer. But you only had a few, and that's OK. But you're going to break those down with, with specifications. So when you think about it the next time around, and this time I'll, I'll read them. If you'll put your email address on them, I'll, I'll give you back your comments so you can make them a little bit better next time. Uh, but think about what your device is actually supposed to do. Right? So it should, if you're making a hip replacement, at some point in there it should say it's going to replace a hip. Right? It's going to allow someone to be able to walk on it, things like that. So don't forget the actual functional specifications, not just the, or user needs, not just the performance ones. And that's a lot of what we'll talk about today, so hopefully that'll make more sense by the time we get done. Does everybody get where, not, where I'm coming from? Okay, a lot of you had those. Uh, so those of you who weren't here last time, uh, don't worry about that criticism, it's not aimed at you. But you probably would have made the same mistake had you been here, so pay attention. Uh, so today we're gonna talk about specification development. You guys want to grab a form? You can sit up front since you came in late. That's okay. Two good spots right there. Uh, so specification development. So specifications are a, a continuance of your user needs. It's a very similar topic. So when you think about user needs are those kind of broad brush, what is this thing supposed to do, and what, how is it supposed to do it? When you get into specifications, we look to quantify those things. So we want to start making them engineering specifications that you could hold someone else accountable to. Because if you get into larger projects than just what you're doing here in Epics, and even some degree in your Epics projects, you need someone else to do something, right? You need someone else to manufacture something for you, to design something for you, and you need to be able to give them the parameters that you're going to hold them to, that you're going to require them to fulfill, okay? So if you're going to build a car for General Motors, right? Which is a poignant example. Uh, we'll talk about General Motors a little bit today. If you're going to design a car for them, you as a single engineer can't design that whole car, right? You as a, as a small engineering group who are going to lead the whole car, uh, you know, the whole development of the car, you can't design every system within that car yourselves. It's too big, okay? So as you start to break things down, you do want to be able to say, okay, the carburetor needs to connect in like this, right? It's not going to have a carburetor anymore. Uh, but you could say the, the fuel tank needs to be able to attach to this system and needs to fit in this space, right? Now, you don't have to design it. You can let someone else design it, but they need to know what those interfaces are. They need to know it's supposed to hold a certain amount of fuel, right? So they need to know what are all of those, those requirements that you have, and that's why we write specifications. So it's a good thing to learn to do now. Um, so today we're going to talk about the importance of specifications. We're going to go through a couple of videos, at least one of which I would bet you've seen before, uh, but it, it still uh, leads a good point to why this is important. Talk about some of the types of specifications. When you actually write your list, you're not going to sort them out by type or anything like that. It's just to give you a method or a framework for which to think about all the specifications. Because what you want to do is try and think of them all. Okay? And that's going to lead your whole project as you go through testing, as you go through design, to think about what are the things that we need to satisfy so that this doesn't go wrong. We'll talk just really briefly about industry standards, something that won't affect your Epics projects, but that you'll need to know about when you write specifications in your career. Um, and then a little bit about a tool called functional decomposition, which some of you have probably done before. And it's really just another method at how you come up with all the specifications and make sure you don't miss any. So I like to do sort of going through the types and then going through the functional decomposition and then cross-checking my list to see which things I missed, okay? So um, we're gonna start, that's really loud. 
Um, We're going to start with the Tacoma Narrows Bridge, which I bet a lot of you have seen before. Um, uh, how many of you have seen the Tacoma Narrows Bridge, heard of it? Everybody who's a civil or ME definitely should have. Okay, Not as many as usual. Uh, so the Tacoma Narrows Bridge was a very famous bridge failure. Um, and we'll, we'll look at it. And as you're going through the video, try and think about what specifications or what, what considerations they may not have made in the design of this. I think they should be fairly obvious, but there are some subtleties in there. Tacoma Bridge, Washington, opened only a few months ago, was built at a cost of over six million dollars. But misfortune overtakes the great structure. These are some of the most amazing pictures ever recorded by a newsreel. Oh. The actual collapse of the world's third largest suspension bridge. All right, anybody guesses on what went wrong with the Tacoma Narrows Bridge? <coughs> didn't account for the wind, didn't account for the wind right? So they didn't, didn't properly specify maybe what kind of wind conditions this would see. Now I would bet that they did account for the wind to some degree, right? So if you're an engineer and you're designing this bridge, you'd be pretty stupid if you didn't account for the wind. But actually, at the time that they were developing bridges like this, uh, the, the main thought in civil engineering at the time was that crosswinds really wouldn't affect a bridge very much. And so they kept building thinner and thinner, lighter and lighter bridges that were more and more flexible. This bridge, they referred to it as Galloping Gertie, uh, actually started to do a, a vertical wave because it was getting um, lift on the bridge from the wind, right? So it was getting higher pressure underneath and lower pressure above. And then it hit uh, a sort of resonant frequency in the bridge with the wind where it started to cr increase its own oscillations until it broke, right? So how many of you would be proud to be the engineer on this bridge? Right? So his career was actually pretty well ruined by this. Uh, nobody wanted to hire him to design any more bridges. There are not a lot of, of structures this big that are built on a regular basis in the world. So getting a job like this is not easy to do. Uh, and his didn't hold up. Um, so looking at those specifications, thinking about what are all of the conditions, all of the boundary effects that could affect my design are an important thing. Now we're going to look at a little bit more of a modern failure. So right now we're in a 2007 cobalt. Jake Fisher, director of auto testing at the nonprofit <coughs> Super Reports, is showing us why 2.6 million GM cars are being recalled. How easy should that be for me to accidentally turn off the ignition, put in the exception? Depends on how much is hanging off the key ring. I don't know why he thinks he did it. He hit a bunch of them. Quite a bit. The flaw in the ignition system makes it possible to turn the key off accidentally. On the road, it can lead to an anxious moment, sudden surprise, or worse. Start the engine up, put it in drive, and as you're driving, the heavy weight here on the key, it takes a couple of to actually turn that off. Once that happens, you can't start the car anymore. Worse, if you lose your power steering, so you lose control, and if you're in the off position, your airbag not going to work. We tried the demo six times. When the engine shut off, the cobalt was harder to control. All right, there it goes. Now I can go around the cones, but I knew that engine's coming. What's the worst case scenario here with this with this car? 
the fact is they're still out on the road. Well, the worst case scenario is, you know, when this happens, you lose the ability to actually steer the car very well, you could lose the ability to stop the vehicle, and you are highly distracted at that time. Along with that, you have the airbag to shut off. So it's very easy to see how an accident could happen and be very tragic. All right, any guesses on this one, what the problem was? Anybody? Right, so if you think from a specification standpoint, if you're the engineer designing this ignition system, right, thinking about what things can go wrong in your ignition system, what it needs to do, being able to support the weight of a heavy set of keys, like I tend to carry as a lab manager, uh, is, a, is an important thing. Uh, so, so that's a pretty that's a pretty serious repercussion from a set of, of specifications. So this is not a, a minor thing, right? So as you start to think about how your product can affect people, you could have these major uh, outcome problems, but you could have much smaller ones as well, right? So if you think about all the things that could go wrong in your projects, um, you start start to think about all the things it needs to do. Um, they may have less impact. They're not going to kill people. They're I think about 140 recognized deaths from this GM ignition switch because uh, you would lose steering and your airbags at the same time. So you are both creating a likely situation for wreck and taking away what protects you in the case of it happening. So it's a really bad thing, right? Uh, and they ended up losing billions of dollars over that. Uh, but your, your projects may have a smaller effect, but they still could be very meaningful to your project partner, to your customer, right? So you want to think these things through. So as I kind of said in the beginning, a, a specification is just the translation of your user need. It needs to do this into uh, something that's sort of quantifiable that you can use in the engineering design process. So if I had made this table and I say this should you know, support my body weight if I stand on it, then I would say it needs to support at least a certain number of pounds, hopefully a factor of safety or two in there as, as well. right? So we were just thinking about trying to translate these things into something that makes sense to us. And there's three types that you can kind of think of First one being functional requirements. So these are related to what it, the, the product should do, or your project should do. Performance requirements are how it should do it. And then interface requirements are about how it would interact with the world around it. Okay, How does it take in inputs and put in outputs? So we'll go into each of these a little bit. So functional requirements, again, just specify what the device does. So if I think about, you know, I'm designing an automobile and I'm looking at the steering wheel that is a heck of a wasp. Um, hi, buddy. Uh, you think, OK, if I turn the wheel with a certain amount of force to a certain angle, then the car should turn accordingly, right? So you're thinking about, I'm putting in some input as the user. I'm getting some output from my device. So if you think of whatever your project may be as being sort of this black box, as just this system level thing, then you can think um, in sort of an abstract way about this, right? I put in some inputs, I get some outputs. What happens inside that black box are my functional requirements. Okay? So if you're working on a software project, it's really easy to think like this because you write actual functions. Okay? So you're saying, here's my inputs, here's my outputs, here's what happens in the middle. But if you're doing a mechanical system, it could be the same thing, like the steering wheel. Okay? If you're thinking about, uh, you're working with one of the museum teams, it may be when a kid pushes this button, it should respond in this way, okay? So all of your systems can be seen as sort of a black box. So if you kind of, I don't like to abstract in these lectures, um, but if we abstract because your systems are so different, your projects are so different, you can think of this in kind of your math terms, right? If you have your outputs as a function of your inputs, then what you're really thinking about here is, what is my function, right? So if that black box is that I'm gonna multiply two numbers, I get four and a two, and I should output an eight, right? That's what I'm looking at in functional specifications. So as you sit down to your project and you think about what my specifications should be, the first ones you'll think of are your functions. The next bit would be interface requirements. And these are how does it interact with the world around it or with other systems, OK? So this could include things like how big can it be? Will it fit in the room? Will it fit in the space that it should be? What does it weigh? Do I need to be able to carry it? Is it portable? Things like that. These are all interface requirements. And the interface could be with a person, or it could be with other physical things in the world. It could be with other software, right? So if you're putting up a website and it needs to take information from somewhere else, you can think about all of those interfaces, all right? Um, and this is the place where you're going to think about things like aesthetics and ergonomics. 
where do you interface with your user, right? So even if it was the kite example we talked about last week, you're going to have interface issues when you think about how it looks, right? Because people are going to see it. How are they interacting with it? Does it excite people? Does it make them happy? So we always try and think from a user-centered perspective, which is why we start with our user needs, and then we go into specifications, right? If you're going from a technology-centered design point of view, you could go right into specifications and start digging into this stuff because you you're not thinking about your user. But that's not how we design. So if we go into our sort of abstraction here again, then the interface part is, what, what are those inputs x? And how am I going to take them in? How does that work, right? So if my system was that museum display and it has you know, buttons and it should do lights and sound if a kid pushes it to tell them about some, something educational, then you're going to think about, how do the kids push those buttons? What kind of buttons would they be? How do I make them intuitive and easy to use? Okay? So you're going to go through all of those, those pieces. And then you're going to think about how does, it output, how does it give the output, right? How does that all work? What kind of boundary conditions might you have? Uh, and then the last set of these are going to be performance requirements. So if you think of, I said, you know, if that black box is a multiplication function, and so I pass in a 4 and a 2 and I get 8, that's great for performance or for a function. But what if it takes you an hour to get that computation? That's not a good system then, right? So just being able to meet the function isn't always enough. You also need good performance at, at meeting that function. Uh, so that's a good case where you could have a, a, a very good functional outcome but not good performance. Uh, this is where you're going to think about things like speed, strength, accuracy. How well should it do what it does, right? So if you're designing a, a new measuring device, does it need to measure to you know, the nearest hundredth of an inch or the nearest quarter of an inch? And it makes a big difference about what you're doing, OK? So your function, maybe it needs to measure. Your performance is how well. And this is where you'll think about uh, environmental things as well. So does your device need to operate in a moist environment, in a hot environment? So I, I've told a lot of you, I used to be a biomedical engineer in orthopedic industry. And all the things that we designed had to work inside a human body, which is not like ambient conditions at all, right? You've got acid base problems. You've got temperature. You have motion. There are a lot of things that happen. You can't get in and add oil when you want, right? So that doesn't work. Uh, so this is where you're going to think about all those things and also reliability and safety. How well should this, you know, what, what is the success rate acceptability? What are the outcomes if you don't do that? Um, so I've got a whole big list of these things that you might think about for stakeholders, right? How does it get manufactured? How does it scale? How do all those things happen from a performance perspective? So we're going to jump into a quick exercise. So uh, on your own, just for your project, write down three each functional interface and performance specifications. And I'll give you just a few minutes for that. No, we'll do that at the end. So we'll do that at the end.
Looks like everybody's finishing up. Can you raise your hand if you're done? Uh, half? Okay, I can give you one more minute. All right, so we're, we're going to move on. So you can hang on to those for now. We'll come back to them in a little bit. Um, everybody kind of understand the, the sort of three different types of specifications, understand how to apply that to your project? Good, yes? You guys are very engaging today, yes? yes. Good, thank you. Um, so when you go to evaluate your specifications, there's a number of things that you want to look at, OK? So writing specifications is one thing. Um, taking a look at them to see if they're any good is another thing. Okay, <laughs> that was exciting. So uh, evaluating your specifications. Uh, <laughs> had to be a wasp, right? It couldn't be like a fly or something. Um, so they should be unambiguous, okay? So uh, they should be verifiable. So where your user needs can be sort of general, like it should be able to withstand the weight of a person standing on it. Your, your specifications need to be verifiable, so they should have numbers to them, okay? So you should be able to check the box, yes or no, it can do this, all right? You generally don't like a check the box mentality, but you're creating the box you're gonna check, so it makes sense in this, in this point, right? So think about, can I tell yes or no this has been done? So these should never be generic, they should always be very specific. They should be um, self-consistent. So again, your user needs can conflict themselves, okay? So a great example of that is you always say, I want it to be low cost, but I want it to be really durable. Well, a lot of times really durable materials are expensive, right? So those things may go against each other, but in your specifications, you're going to be more specific. When you say it should be affordable, you're going to say it should be less than $100, right? And when you say durable, you should say it should last for three years. And then you can look at solutions that meet both of those criteria, okay? Does that make, that's an important point. So your user needs are what they are, right? Your user's gonna tell you, I want it to be cost effective and I want it to last the rest of my life. You can't always meet those, but you understand those are what your user is, is requesting. Your specifications, you'd better be able to meet, okay? If you can see that wasp behind me again, don't just laugh at me, let me know. Uh, so, so they should be non-conflicting in your specifications. User needs, it's fine. Specifications, there should be a real solution space that can meet all of the specifications, okay? So don't, don't write specifications that there is no real solution, okay? Um, next, they should be specific to the use environment. So you really want to think about your use environment. So again, I talked about, you know, in, in uh, implants that go in the human body, you have a very specific set of conditions. Uh, but it could be as simple as we're putting something outside. We thought we would make it out of 3D printed PLA. Well, surprise, surprise, that's degradable. And in the rain, that would be a really poor choice. So you want to think about the specific use environment that your product is going to go into. Um, and then you should include pass-fail criteria for verification. So this is forward-looking, OK? When you get to the end of your project, it's really too late. But you should be um, working on how you're going to test your product at the end, right? So you, as you go along, you'll run tests for development. But you get to the end, you're going to say, did this work? So verification is asking yourself, did I meet my specifications, OK? So that's simply what verification is. When you go to test at the end and you're not sure what test you should run, you simply look back to your list of specifications. Every one of your specifications, you should be able to point to a real verification test that says, yes, I passed this, right? So it could be very simple, right? If you say it should be less than 100 pounds, you weigh it. If you say it should be less than 3 feet by 3 feet by 3 feet cube, you measure it, right? It could be very simple, but those are still tests. Okay, or they could be very complex things that require lots and lots of testing. Okay, but you should have pass-fail criteria, and you should think of those before you design. Okay, at the time of writing specifications, at the beginning of your project, before you've had your first concept written down on paper, you should know what those test criteria would be. All right, because if you don't, then you'll cheat when you get to the time of testing, and you will make up criteria that you know you can pass, 
and those won't be those will be shaded by your view at that time instead of being honest with yourself up front and asking what your user needs, right? So if, if in the very beginning I say I'm going to make a table and three of us guys should be able to stand on the table and not break, and then I design my table and I say, I think one is okay, right? Then you, you're taking away some of your discipline because you're trying to meet your own design criteria. You're trying to make your solution work instead of making a solution that does work, right? Does that make sense? Okay, so that's how you evaluate criteria. So when you go back and look at your list of specifications, think about those things, right? Do they conflict? Are they verified? Can I put pass-fail criteria to them? Um, so I want to touch just for a second on industry standards. Most of your projects and epics won't uh, be affected by industry standards. Um, but when you get into industry, they certainly will. So um, there's a couple types of these. One would be technical specifications. And technical specifications are thinking about things like, um, like design pieces that are universal between different industries, right? So if you design bolts, there are thread patterns that are standards. And there are standards organizations that meet and create those standards to say what that should be. So that as you interchange parts between manufacturers, they work. But you also have things like um, standards for, for automobiles that they have to be able to withstand a certain number of, <laughs> of cycles. Uh, bugs are always aggressive in the fall, aren't they? Don't be too distracted. I, I certainly wasn't when you came flying in my shirt color. <laughs> uh, material standards, things like that. So when you say I'm going to make something out of, out of 316 stainless steel or 17.4 stainless steel, that means something, right? There is a, a real output of what that, that means. It should have a certain chemical composition. It should have a certain strength and hardness. We are all very distracted by one tiny bug. <laughs> And then there are things like standard operating procedures, okay? And those may be how you go about manufacturing something, right? So if you're going to apply a certain coding, something like that, there may be standards within your industry that you want to comply to, and that'll let you get through regulatory bodies easier, things like that. Um, and then there are also things like methods or practice standards. So a good example of a method or practice standard is if you're a physician, you have different sets of diagnostics that you run when someone presents with a certain set of symptoms that in general are accepted as the right way to go through those, to treat those patients, right? And if you go outside of those, you open yourself up to lawsuits and things.